Blacking China, Season 2, sponsored by Hayden T. Joseph, Certified Public Accountant. Visit us at advancedamericantax.com. Yeah. We, like, took the way, I bet if we went the correct way, we'd probably be almost at my apartment right now. Well, probably not. It's like, uh, you have to tell me all the bad words. I think the first one I want to know is how you say nigger. Like, what's a nigger in Chinese? Like, how, how you say that? They're like, oh, we don't have a word like that. But they said we have something that's it's offensive like that, but it's not. It's not the word nigger. So I said, what? What? what if? She told me the word, and I, I can't fucking remember. She told me years ago. <coughs> but it, what it meant was like she's like it's like a mixed egg, like a type of mutt. Like it's like if you call a Chinese person this word, like it's like calling them like a nigger. It's like the worst. Damn. It's like the worst word you could say. So so I was I, I went into a meeting and and um, yo a dude fucking said it because I was a dude said the word I heard it. He said it the right thing. He just said it out loud. He was talking to another guy and he said the word like. It was like me, me, and, I was, it was me and two other people, and, we were, and I was here because I do a pal, do clothing. So I, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was here, was here in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So the guy, the guy, the guy was telling me something like he had a problem with the color or something, you know. And I said, well, I don't give a fuck. Like you gotta fix it. Like you know, like, like I'm not accepting it because you have a problem or whatever. Your people just it has to be right. It has to be right. And then they were like, you know, oh, you know, something. And I think you know, he said the word. He said it. He said it, and I went, excuse me? And he went, what? And I was like, what did you just say? And um, he's like, oh, excuse, excuse me, we'll be right back. So they just left the room, like, I'm sorry, we'll be right back. So they went outside to talk, you know? All the face, go. Yeah, on. and then, like, dude turned real red when I when I heard it. So, they, so then um, that evening, like, we go to dinner or whatever, and they were all like, yo, so I heard you understand Chinese. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, uh-huh, see? So it pays to learn the bad words, man. I think. I think um, artists generally use color a certain way. So, for example, like the Stern character, another gentleman in the interview, his character is readily identifiable. Um, like, if I would see a building that he painted, I would know that's his style. Like, it's a signature way he does things. I think for me, it's kind of like there's something common that goes throughout every single different painting, whether it's a woodcut piece or neon. Like. <clears throat> It's like a handwriting. It's like you're always gonna be able to like know, recognize your handwriting, even if it evolves a little bit over the years. Like there's something consistent. So it's like just the way I move my hand, the way I mix colors, the way I perceive colors and shapes. Like I think that's consistent, no matter what the medium is. Um, but a lot of my work is is deals with politics and political and social kind of uh, interactions. Like <clears throat> the piece behind me. This was for a. Uh, this was for a show in Shanghai was to actually documenting the Chinese presence in Cuba. So like, that was interesting because I had to do a bunch of research and, and actually you know, like interview a bunch of people about, you know, like being like Cuban Chinese and stuff like that. And uh, also introducing people in China to the, to the fact that like there is, like you guys are familiar with the diaspora in the UK, in New York City, in San Fran. Do you know there's also like Peru and Latin America, like there is a like Chinatown in Havana. You know, it's like, one of the most famous artists, like Wilfredo Lam, he's like half Chinese and half Cuban. It's like he's like a world famous artist. It was like it was almost like also just educating people to like their own kind of culture, their own history, and like not just the Chinese white mixture, but also like it goes beyond that. You know, like that goes into a whole bunch of social issues and stuff like that, and you know, colonial things. It's stern. Like I, I think I think it's ridiculous that people even ask like what type of art do you do. I do stern. I do me. It's like sometimes, I'm, I'm most of the time fascinated with people's faces, expressions, and lifestyle. And I find so much familiar. I mean, a face is a face. It's, it's eyes, two eyes, the nose, the mouth. And sometimes it might be a missing an eye. You know, I mean, sometimes a person might be missing a nose. You know, I've seen these. So I like to do whatever I feel. Maybe I feel like having a face that doesn't have a, an eye. Uh, you know, maybe it doesn't have a nose. Maybe he doesn't have lips, you know, he or she. 
it's but what I what I want people to really feel about my art is that it's either it's either something that you can relate to present the past or something maybe you wish to see in the future. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned sociology, like that's why I got my master's in it. Even though I I'm an artist, like yeah. I always see the world through the lens of that. And I'm always looking at like social relationships here, social hierarchies. And to me it's like <laughs> it's, it's it's hard, it's terrible. Yeah. You no, know, like um how they build the poverty and push it up in Hong Kong. That's the first hierarchy I, mean, I know. So, so. Like if you want to talk about like even like the domestic work, so if yeah. you want to talk about like even if you go to like Simpson Troy, TSC, and you want to, like the Nigerian experience. Yeah. You know, um, like it, it's 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 not as welcoming. It's not the Asia world city that it claims itself to be. It's very selective and and uh, who it welcomes and who it doesn't. You know, who doesn't welcome? Well, like I I. That to me is where the creativity comes from. Like I, I, I really don't get inspired by other artists. It's always I'm always inspired by like nature and always inspired by like um, people like Arusai. Like his his book like Orientalism is like one of the foundations of of a lot of paintings, a lot of series. Um, because I think social hierarchy and social interaction is so prevalent, especially where I'm from in New York. Like. No matter how gentrified a neighborhood is, no matter what the, the the income levels are, like you see how the state and the state bodies deal with different people, you know, and it's just like, why? How did it become this way? You know, like what makes the police force in America so much more aggressive than like the one on the mainland? You know, on an everyday basis, because like when the mainland needs to get down, they get down. Because I've seen them like break up riots and. And Hong Kong too, there ain't no difference. Like they build up the clubs, like they, they'll beat your ass. It's like the NYPD will beat your ass. <laughs> you know, so it's like a, bat a baton is a baton, you know, like. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, th I think sociology and also anthropology always inform the way I the way I view the world, the way I perceive the world. Because like you said, that's how I was trained, you know, so. Same thing as Vegas, like you just knock off the, the whole thing from Vegas, it's the same thing. Except they got like shitty food in the, in the Venetian here. You have like a food court with like the fat burger, you know. Like you won't see that in the Venetian in, in Vegas. They got like, you know, cheap shit, soup, you know, like a bunch of pork shit. What's up, man? Why are you standing like this, huh? I think, like when I first moved here, all I did was stay like in Central because I lived there. I lived in Shenguang. And like, of course, like if you're just involved in that lifestyle, like it's comforting. It's like, you know, you don't need to learn any Cantonese, you don't need to obviously know any Mandarin. But like, if you want to like get things done, and you do it like, I, you know, I'm an artist, like I have to get things manufactured. Like I have to go to the In terms of the art scene, like Beijing is much better than Shanghai. So like for what I do, the mainland um, is more beneficial to me. But also I think people are, I think the spirit of the people are, is, is, is just more down to earth in the mainland, you know, like, yeah, I know I'm from New York, so it's like Hong Kong doesn't it like impresses me, but it doesn't. And I think people here, like you know, like China has all the money. Hong Kong is obviously you know very well off. You know, like after a while, people's attitudes is just you know it's like sickening. I like, like Hong and everybody's too good to talk to. It's like there's no humanity in Hong Kong. It's like fuck that. You know, I'd rather go to the mainland where people actually have fun and will speak to you and just like be human and chill. You know? Do you speak Mandarin? Um. It's better than my Cantonese. <laughs> um, my girl, she's actually half Chinese, half Nigerian. Oh wow! She speaks Cantonese. She was born here. She speaks Cantonese and Mandarin. So like, she's been teaching me. I'm like, just teach me Mandarin. Like Cantonese, I like I know how to curse. I know how to get by in Cantonese. I know how to. It's just like it's nine tones. Like let's just deal with the Mandarin, especially for business. <laughs> but yes, it's interesting. Like you're right. Like um, there's a big population, obviously, of Africans and like. Uh, Guangzhou and I would say like in the last seven years like they've really cracked up like I have friends who know me like 20 years ago and they're like some of them like permanent residents you know yeah. like wives children you know mixed children and everything but like people who try to migrate now forget about it like don't even think about it like yeah, go to Vietnam or something like it's yeah. just not welcoming anymore yeah. it's not gonna happen I went to school with one of the campaign managers for Obama. Uh, this was 2008, this was before he got elected. Um, so he was telling me all the, the whole summer before the election, he was like, yo man, like, you know, we're, we're in Chicago, we're in LA, like, we're doing this campaign. 
uh, you know, speeches, like, you should come by, like, you know, like, do something, hand out t-shirts, or you know, shake hands, kiss babies, or something like that. I'm like, ah, oh, we'll see, we'll see, man, like, we'll see if it's gonna work out for you know, the brother, whatever. And, you know, like, come, like, September, I'm like, wow, he's really gaining momentum, like, he's really, he's the candidate, and shit, like, he's gonna go against McCain. And, um, you know, my friend was, my friend got moved up in high ranks in terms of, like, like, like one of his personal aides, personal assistants. So, um, one day, I had done, I did something for Obama. Yeah, I had done a painting, I'm like, oh, this is sort of a moment. And so I just had it in my house. And I sent it to my friend. I was like, yo, yo, look what I did. Finally, I did something. And, like, he didn't ask me. And then one day, like, 3 o'clock in the morning, he's like, yo, can you come to Philadelphia by 7? So like, Philadelphia is like a two hour drive from, from New York. I'm like, well, yeah, I got four hours, I can do it. It's three o'clock in the morning. He's like, yo, go to, go to the airport. I'm like, what? He's like, just go to the airport. I'm like, all right. He's like, go to private, the private one, not the, the public one, go to the, the private airfield. I'm like, all right, fuck it. So I brought the painting, he's like, okay, bring the painting. So we got into like the big private airport hangar and I had it in a, in a garbage bag because it was raining. So like, you know, you have to get checked by Secret Service because he was a candidate. So they're like, oh, what's in the garbage bag? I pulled it out. I'm like, oh yeah, the painting. They're like, oh, that's amazing. Cool, cool. They didn't even check it for like chemicals. It could be like paint with paint with cyanide and shit. So, <laughs> so anyway, like, so um, he was doing a speech in Philadelphia. They drove him onto the airfield. He boarded the plane, and then we were allowed a couple minutes to go on and meet him. So I had the painting with me. I met him. Like, took a photo of him. Sat in his chair with the painting, and like, I just left it on board. I'm like, because we have to go. He had like another speech to give like in another part of Pennsylvania. So you had to get off the plane. I didn't think anything about it. I'm like, well, I, I wrote something in the back. Like, I gave it to him and like, whatever. So then the next day I get a phone call and like, he was like, oh, thank you for the painting and all this stuff and stuff. And he signed one of his campaign posters, like, change we could believe in. Like, you know, two Nelson thanks Obama. And um, yeah, like the next day when he had some downtime, like he had my friend, I sent him like a one page write up formally like explaining what was in the images of the paintings and stuff like that and like you see like all the people like in the campaign um, like you know looking at it like they really took time out to like you know like examine this painting and stuff like that and like you know from other people I heard like it, it wound up in just like Hyde Park Chicago apartment and stuff like a house over there and I mean that was it it was like on a whim I just did a painting and I was able to kind of like board the plane and give it to him and appreciate it and I received like some money from it as well randomly which I, sh I guess I should not have cashed the check because the check was probably more important than the cash <laughs> the cash is low on God but <laughs> um, yeah it was it's because to me like I hate when people like if, if you meet another artist and they have a show like usually what they do is like oh I've done stuff for so and so so and so like to me that's stupid it's like well I just just tell me what the fuck the yellow color means. I don't care about like, you know, who has your shit. Like, you know, so it's like, I, I never even think about that when people ask like, Obama. I'm like, yeah, he, yeah. The, wor the world to me is very small. And the only way I figured out how the world is very small was to go and travel abroad. I grew up hanging out on the stoops of Brooklyn and drinking 40s and, and getting past L's. You know that that that's that was the that was happening at that that moment in the time, and that's that's growing up. Not everybody does that. Not everybody should do that. I'm not I'm not condoning any of that. But whatever whatever somebody's heart is, is in, the world is very small. And it's a, it is it is absolutely a beautiful place. I feel that if I stayed in the situation or if I was still on that same stoop. It could get very ugly, and I knew it was ugly. I, I was living, I was living and hanging on the stoop for so many years. So for me, like for any any up and coming youth that are going through a struggle, a feeling that they can't do something, or they told that they're they're, they're insane for th or you're crazy, you think you can do something, you're crazy if you think you can make it. You know, anybody who says that, they're crazy. And, and that's the thing, you know, about people is that I used to think that I was crazy when I would say my crazy ideas to someone, and they would say that I'm crazy. Now that I'm in Hong Kong and, and, and I'm and, and I and I love Hong Kong, there's so many good points about it, about about this place. 
every place has its pros and cons. But I look at the good things that I like here, and that's why I'm here, and I'm, and I'm staying here.